again. Can you tell me, G, can you give me a kind of indication of when you're, um, when we're online? So you're, you're, you're doing the streaming, G, as well, yeah? It looks like we're online now and recording. Yeah, let's start. Okay. So, uh, hello, I'd like to uh, welcome you to a very special session, um, Zaha in Miami. My name is Neil Leach. I'm the director of the new two-year non-residential Doctor of Design program at Florida International University in Miami. And this is the second um, in a series of Miami Beach, uh, um, Miami Urban Studies, uh, uh, the lectures in the Miami Urban Studies course, um, Miami, Do You Love Me? Um, today, we're going to be looking at uh, Zaha Hadid uh, and her special affection for Miami. Many of you will know that uh, Zaha recently, um, the office, Zaha Hadid Architects recently opened uh, um, the design for their tower, 1000 Museum, was recently opened in Miami. And many will know, of course, that Zaha tragically died when she was in Miami. But many will not know that actually Zaha spent a lot of her time in Miami. She owned a, a suite um, on Miami Beach and uh, she would spend much of her winter in Miami. Um, today we're bringing together, I think, three, three very special people who um, know, know knew Zaha very well um, to talk about her special affection, that, that um, the special affection that um, Zaha had for Miami. Uh, uh, we have, we were delighted to have Patrick Schumacher here today. Um, Patrick, uh, as you will know, is the principal of Zaha Hadid Architects. Um, he is an extraordinary person in many ways, uh, someone with boundless energy. In addition to uh, running the office, he also teaches all over the world, is a colleague of mine in Shanghai, um, and is the author of a number of books. Um, uh, prodigiously uh, energetic, I would say, in many ways. Um, and uh, he has been guiding the, the, the practice uh, since the death of Zaha. We're delighted to be able to um, welcome Patrick today. Also, um, I'm delighted to have uh, Claudia Bush here. Claudia Bush is a colleague of mine at Florida International University. Uh, she worked with, with um, Zaha for, for many years and now, and more recently has been collaborating on a series of projects. She will, be also be, she will also be reminiscing on her recollections of Zaha in Miami. And finally, also John Stewart, uh, another colleague from Florida International University who has been running uh, MBUS, Miami Beach Urban Studies that Zaha visited, and who also has connections um, with the office. So the way we're gonna to proceed today is that Patrick's gonna kick off and uh, um, talk about some of the projects that Zaha was involved in uh, in Miami. Um, then I'm gonna hand, hand over to Claudia Bush, who's gonna talk about her recollection the, and the recollections of Zaha and the projects that, on which she collaborated. And finally, John Stewart's gonna come in and we can have a discussion about this topic. So um, I'd like to invite Patrick, first of all, to, um, to uh, share his screen and uh, say something about uh, Zaha in Miami. Thank you, Patrick. Absolutely, it's a nice, nice event. Uh, welcome everybody, I'm happy to be here. So I will show, um, the 1000 Museum Tower, which is for us an uh, absolute milestone project. And I'll show you a few uh, other skeleton projects. This is one of two skeleton projects we realized having designed uh, 50 or so <laughs> to reach uh, the construction of, of two. And the Mary one is a particular beautiful and, and wonderful piece for us, a big step forward. Um, well, we later can talk more, Claudia, with Claudia about the uh, um, Zaha's uh, affection for Miami. I mean, she had so many friends here, not only Claudia, but 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 many others who who lived here. And she came every uh, winter, every December for Miami at Basel, and stayed uh, initially mostly in the Delano Hotel, and then later on upgraded to. <laughs> to more luxurious places. And in the end, she had a wonderful flat and expanded it uh, and in the end, um, self-designed uh, at the, um, oh God, oh, I forgot. W Hotel, no? Uh, the W Hotel, of course. Um, um, and it was nice, really nice time with all the friends and met many dinners and she loves the sun and the beach and the pool and uh, relaxation 
of course, Miami is a fantastic spot for, 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 you know, not only friends of Miami being there and at that time, but friends from London, from New York, from many other places. So as a social place, it's really unique. And uh, there's also where you, where you can catch up with friends because it's, there's, this is where, where there's a certain schedule uh, where particular also New Year, many New Year's parties were, were, were celebrated in Miami and they're very fond memories and the, the atmosphere in Miami is very, very friendly and easygoing. And that's what she liked. The people are very, very friendly. We had several different projects. Uh, Claudia will show some others and other uh, failed attempts to get projects here. I uh, didn't show all of those, but uh, so I'll talk about the tower, which was wonderful to have this opportunity. Uh, we met also the, um, the clients, uh, Louis Birdman and Craig Coven, and uh, through, through friends, through connections. They had actually um, uh, commissioned the uh, Chats Tower, um, what's, uh, what's, um, uh, right next door, which is a beautiful tower. And um, so, so uh, that's the way we, we, we got into it. <laughs> um, let me share my screen. Uh, Chad Oppenheim, he's a great architect and he was also friends of Zaha and slightly upset that we got that tower. <laughs> he was hoping to get it, to do that one. Um, all right, so I have one second. Is that coming through? Okay. Yes. Great. So this is my slide I often use to, to introduce tectonism and, and so, uh, Miami Tower as a, as, a, as a structural expression belongs into that um, latest phase of parametricism. And it's, it's a more mature and, and intricate style and, and methodology and paradigm. So, And we, we had uh, worked towards uh, this uh, on a number of projects where we try to express the structure in particular, have used the structure and um, the differentiation of the structure, which should and would be if it was properly optimized, uh, different at the lower part of the tower, mid tower, upper part of the tower. So these members become more or less network, more, uh, uh, more, uh, more denser and thicker at the bottom and uh, uh, less networked and more filigree at the top. So we've done that a number of times. We use sometimes topology optimization. We did a lot of that uh, as well with students first. Um, so I don't have that to showing, but DRL and also the Vienna Studio, we explored these opportunities. And the idea here is also that the differentiation of the skeleton is then becomes a guide for programmatic differentiation. And also there's been a number of examples, uh, some stuff from, from New York, for, for Kuala Lumpur, you can see here the, the, the very strong differentiation in, in stages and segments or, or kind of gradient. This is the other one, <laughs> second, only skeleton tower we've, we've managed to, um, to execute. Sorry, this became more images later. This were uh, one, one of the uh, study for Rabat, another study for another Middle Eastern tower. Um, so also the, the, the depths of the skeleton relief and then a secondary facade kind of structure can also do shading work. This we got relatively far with, uh, this was for Bilbao. But in the end, it also didn't work. So you can see how the interesting uh, topic of layering facade and structure. Um, so so uh, this was more or less simultaneously with the Miami design. Some towers in um, Brisbane, Australia also didn't come through. So I mean, these larger projects, there's so many factors. Uh, which can get in the way, whether it's a finance, something happening with a client or neighbors putting injunctions that happened here, by the way. Um, yeah, this is uh, the, uh, the, the, the tower in Macau where, where we also managed to finally get something built. Uh, now, so, so this is 
the Miami design, I think it's beautiful. Uh, the rhythm which of differentiation, the way the skeleton um, um, moves through different phases, as it were, as it moves up and becomes quite fully free and open with the column splitting up at the corner, quite heavy and, and encompassing the podium at the, at the lower part. And then initially, this was also designed in a way that we, was, we, we were initially briefed with three apartments at the bottom part, two apartments uh, in the middle part, and one apartment per floor that is in the, in the top part. And this was also then aligning with the, with the changing of the structural um, articulation. Uh, in the end, uh, the, these were also, in the end, divided only into two per floor. And that was initially the... Um, the idea. You can see here that in the lower part, there's also two um, double height, uh, like kind of townhouse apartments. Otherwise, they're, they're very large single floor flats. And um, you can see here already the, we had worked on all the interiors as well. So, so fantastic lobby spaces, uh, pool deck, and amenity in the in the in the between the, the podium, which is car park, by the way, and then top of tower, special uh, amenities for the top 10 floors up here. So this is the way it was rendered out. This is a Chad Oppenheim tower. Same clients as one of the best towers, I think, in, in, in Miami as well. Um, so these clients definitely have um, taste. Um, and this is the way I used to show the project when we were, before we started to build, I mean, rendering out the uh, beautiful uh, tower and then showing top of tower, showing these balconies uh, and the vistas you would get. Lay down have some photos. We actually built, um, um, I don't, couldn't find a photo now. We built a mock-up of this whole balcony part, uh, which had to do with a special construction method of having precast elements uh, pulled together around the rebar and then filled with concrete. So it's a kind of solid bond of prefab and in situ. Only at the bottom part, we had to shift to uh, in situ then cladding afterwards. But otherwise, this is, this is the, uh, the, I don't have many floor plans in this, but this is the floor plan of the pool deck. And it's interesting, it's, it's quite beautiful. You get a pool and you get a, a fitness area and so on. And then we get this fantastic lodger where you also see the structure, where you're between the structure and the, and the, and the facade. I have photos later of that. That's the condition here. The, 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 it's obvious. So, so this, this, this is the, the plan for the top of tower. Um, with the, um, the pool areas and the split columns, etc., cetera. Um, and the very fantastic social spaces. That's where we had the opening party. Unfortunately, I don't, couldn't find images of that yet. Uh, last year we did the opening party in the, in, in the winter. So this is a design with some double height area, a special big table, massive table, and then a um, pool up here. And beautiful staircase um, uh, swinging up across these two levels. This is a rendering. So this is a construction that worked, went rather well. It, it was a certain risk involved to use that first time in the world uh, construction to bring, ship these panels from a charger and bring them together around the prepared rebar, lock them together. Initially, it was meant to be just tied together. In the end, they had also steel kind of braces to pull them together and then pour the concrete and do that floor by floor. Um, this was only possible because the, 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 uh, the concrete manufacturer was also connected to one of the investors, actually. So, which, which, which meant there was a synergy and, um, and the risk was just taken, <laughs> it went well. Um, 
Here you can see that at the bottom, this was in situ. Here you can see we started up here from up here. We started with the with this special system, and below it, later on, with the cladding was put up. Because these curves were too strong, and also timing meant that we just had to get the thing out of the ground, and and couldn't wait for 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 this kind of special technique to come through. And this just was a thrill to see uh, when we came and before it was finished. Uh, see these things going up and see the beautifully sculpted surfaces and this voluptual sense and this is around the car park I and mean, these are these fantastic multi-story boomerangs uh, to screen um, um, uh, the car park and of course lets a lot of uh, air and ventilation into the, into the car park and some of these panels were inhuman to, to place i mean we were cursed by our project manager on site. Um, I mean, it was fantastic. I mean, they're super precise, but um, um, I mean, Chris Lapine uh, uh, um, specified one centimeter um, uh, tolerance and he, that was obviously absolutely in. <laughs> uh, um, oh, um, so, but, but then we, this, is, uh, this is the beautiful kind of fiber concrete pieces, this was uh, more resin-based fiber, concrete, lightweight concrete, and um, this is the side view. As we go around and look up, the, si the side view is relatively flat uh, because we don't have balconies here, only at the edge. So all the three sides are different. The front has, you know, the very, very large balconies, the two and then one, and then the back side has more uh, articulation of sub balconies. So it's it's interesting. They all all sides look different, and and this is the entrance, uh, which is quite strong uh, with that kind of kickback, leading you into the into the um, the building. So that's when it started to finish the way it appears, the way the light plays on it, um, with that beautiful continuous uh, cantilevering balcony uh, uninterrupted for the whole width of the tower. And then here we have this um, two um, glass kind of scoops meeting to separate the two, two apartments here. From the uh, museum um, park, looking up obliquely, so this is the backside, which is a little bit different. You can see here that, um, um, that there's more subdivisions with respect to, I mean, just, it's still one apartment, but uh, you know, these are huge apartments. So there might be different parties or, or you have more for your guests, you have more privacy for some of these balconies. And uh, just a few more minutes and it's very nice detail. So, uh, difficult in America, particular to do this in in situ concrete would be uh, quality control wise very difficult as well as um, timing probably. And uh, but the feeling is very solid. So you can see how the how the apartments separate out. You have privacy strong privacy in each uh, balcony. Some details, so this is the entrance and uh, some nice um, lobby designs, integrated furniture, of course, like we do, um, working with the architecture. This is kind of five reinforced plaster. And then the pool deck, it's quite beautiful with these, uh, let's say, arcade layered spaces um, all around the, the tower at that point. And with a lot of interesting you know, niches and, and in between spaces, covered spaces. Um, and nice vistas. 
these were the most, some of these most difficult pieces up here um, where we get cursed about the tolerance demands. This is the view from the pool deck out. So inside you get um, the, all the fitness zones and then you have this nice in between, you should look at, back at the structure and that space between the, 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 in, the inner en envelope and the exterior structure. The next level up, there's amenity space, at, uh, saunas and things like that and beauty, whatever, I mean. And so we've designed that uh, bar and then the, it leads to another level up actually uh, with that staircase and um, some, I don't know even what solar, whatever, <laughs> lounge uh, seats. Uh, this is a kind of timber scoop. And then looking up, so we're going up. This is some of the snapshots I made of the apartment, the, the balcony condition at night. Uh, viewing out to, I think, uh, south, towards South Beach during the day. And this is the big uh, front balcony. Um, this is Chris, the main project architect, it's a fantastic job. Um, this is really a, a very large balcony. Yeah. You can see more of those fantastic uh, spaces. They're quite deep and long and it's great for parties. I mean, I've seen parties on balconies, the whole party on the balcony. This is the kind of thing you, you do in Miami if you can. Um, and this is the apartment inside, it's quite tall. You can see here's the, 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 the corner balcony, then the split column, and then comes the, uh, the, big, the big balcony. It's, it's, it's fantastic um, patch. The very top of tower, so there's a double height area and then there's a kind of single height area with the pool and this beautiful kind of water reflection like pattern, flower pattern. Um, and uh, it's very clean. Uh, there's nothing uh, but the beautiful relief which reflects the light beautifully. The night view. So these are also uh, fiber reinforced plaster panels, and there's a very nice kind of uh, relief. Reminds us of the paper relief we used to do at the office, and a nice kind of free swinging steel staircase mediating between these two levels. So you can see uh, so the towards the double height. Of course, in Miami at that height, the wind forces are pretty, pretty extreme. So that's why the, 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 the glasses margins are quite strong. And yeah, some nice views up that across the two levels. I enjoyed that. There's a helipad on top. And um, it's one of the few things is, you know, this is, is, is attracting a special crop of, of, of customers. Um, so that's about a tower. We had uh, these um, kind of Russian origin clients who wanted to do another one close by. So we started to sketch this, but it didn't come to anything. But I wanted to end up with this because this is something which I thought it was a very nice idea and a nice design. Uh, this is Miami Beach, there's a kind of large site um, and the idea here is this to a private university by a Brazilian university entrepreneur to launch that in Miami. I think it's a great idea with all the Latin Americans, you know, converging on Miami anyway and to, to, to get a lot of uh, Latin American students maybe come there. Uh, so that's it's a, it's a quite dense uh, with the gardens and um, with uh, these kind of shading areas and balconies and bridges. Um, these would be the classrooms um, 
on on different levels. So that, that that's something we developed, and the Miami Beach um, mayor loved it. But in the end, it didn't come together. I don't know what it was. It was I think the the investors got uh, in in some kind of conflict. Um, I, I I don't know if it would have been uh, would have been approved. I think the, uh, I forgot about that. There's also a political process of voting in Miami Beach, uh, which would would have would have happened. I mean, it's something which I think killed our our car park project. <laughs> but Claudia will tell us more about that. Um, yeah, it's so nice. We did a lot of effort. The client in the end ran away without paying us. So I don't know if that's. that's um, that's not a shame. <laughs> Just on the side, but well, it's a beautiful design, so we'd like to like to show it here. Uh, well, Claudia might have more, but this is the, the so in the end, in the last few years, Zaha, um, she always rented in uh, in uh, W Hotel, and she started a purchase. She then fused two adjacent um, apartments into that. Bringing her own furniture, tables, sofas, and, and, and uh, design. And art she purchased at, 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 at Art Basel. So. It's a very nice place. So that's for me. I hand back. Patrick, that was, that was great. That was great. Um... Super interesting projects. Um, maybe we can head over to Claudia. Um, Claudia, as I mentioned, uh, used to work with uh, with Zaha for Zaha, and then uh, has been collaborating on a number of projects. So, uh, Claudia, welcome. Okay. Yes, Patrick, that's great. I love the building. The building is just stunning. One thousand museum. I mean, we live here, and I I think the success of it is it works at every scale. Like when I drive down the highway, I see it as part of the skyline. I go down like you, you have this view when you go down on Biscayne Boulevard and we're looking up and it's just this weaving structure that goes up. And then when you are inside, actually to experience the structure, it's something completely different. You know, like I love the, there's one apartment, I, you saw it, the corner, you get on it and you look out and you have this amazing view. It looks like you are on a ship actually. And then the last floor, you know, it's really beautiful. It's um, the, where the pool is and the reflection of the light on this, of, on this pattern. And it's a really stunning building. I mean, we're so lucky to have this building here and that it got completed in Miami. So yes, I worked for SAR actually a really long time ago, 30 years. And that was after I studied in Germany. And then I went to the States and studied at Columbia University. And um, so for a personal reason, and also because maybe I didn't want to go back to Germany, I wanted to go to a city where there are opportunities. And so in the early 90s, when I came to my own me, I thought there were opportunities. It took just a little longer than I thought. So then Saha, so let me share. Um, okay. Let me share. Came. Um, 20 years ago, the first time to Miami. And so, and she came 20 years ago, the, the first time, and she, like uh, Patrick was mentioning, she would come here for vacation. And um, so, you know, we, we saw each other every year for vacation. We became really good friends. And um, so we spend also time with my, my daughter. So you see, this is actually Saha on the left with my youngest daughter. And um, the one on the right is, so that was 16 years ago. And then the one on the right is my daughter, you know, a couple of years older. And we're walking down Lincoln Road and she goes, look, mommy, there is Saha on the book. And she pulls it out and she shows it to me. So, you know, it is something about Sa. Sa was a very warm and kind person, but had this capacity of, you know, how, she, you know, socializing with all of us, but she also was this celebrity. So, um, 
Yes, as Patrick mentioned, she really loved Miami. She loved the the warm weather um, to to come here, but she also liked that the city had many other things to offer. And the, um, so she, she developed a lot of friendships, and um, you know, she also became part of this community. Um, at the end, you know, she bought this place, and so you know, so she here she is with us. You know, she came to our office. You know, I have also an office and she came to our office and she gave several lectures. Um, the one on the top right is her at the Young Arts, all with FIU students. Um, the one on the, and all the FIU students were really like excited seeing her here. And um, like I said, there's, um, you know, Miami is a great place um, to, to be outdoor, you know, so this is, you know, us in the group, you know, having lunch at the mandolin and then, you know, the, the great friends that and connections she made. And I think one of the things, um, so the top right is the director and conductor of the Miami Symphony Orchestra, Eduardo Madrid, and then a really good friend, Irani Sakan, a photographer. So what really changed, I think, Miami is not just the architecture, it's also the people the people that came and actually stayed. So, um, you know, a lot of times in the 90s, people would come here, transients, you would come for visit, vacation, but leave. But what happened in the in 2000s and since the last uh, 10, 12 years, people actually from all over the world stay. And I think that they are for a different architecture. Um, as I said, so going back when she was here 20 years ago, she she loved the hotels along Miami Beach. And if you come for a visit, certainly go go down that strip. These are the amazing hotels from the from the 40s. Um, so the first one was where she stayed is the Delano Hotel that was remodeled by Philip Stark. And in 2000, it was the Hip Hotel, and it was really fun and and cool to hang out at, at the pool. Um, then later she bought a place at the W. So that is actually, you know, a couple of hotels down uh, to, the, to the north. Um, and, you know, you see, they all have like this amazing, beautiful view out to the ocean and the beach in front. So um, as Patrick mentioned, I, I was here on site, you know, working with a great team of Saha Hadid architects, you know, in London, you know, they did all the design and I was here basically, you know, checking that, you know, everything is smooth and, and, and well. And so what, um, you know, after several design studies, there was basically this one idea to transform uh, the apartment. It was a very simple idea actually to use this dividing walls with two apartments and um, that dividing wall between the two apartments to replace it with this continuous ribbon. And as this is a very simple idea, but it's actually much more complex to build it because you know, when you see it, you, know, you can't put one continuous ribbon of metal transported into the apartment. So it was actually built in four pieces and then melded so that one would see no seam. And um, the floor as well, you see there's like a resin and it created this complete uh, smooth surface. And I think, you know, for the architects, it's really important the scene as, as it's an, um, an element of the design. So there were a lot of um, photographs done, a lot of very detailed oriented that is done perfectly well. Uh, we probably sent them like a hundred pictures. So these are some images of the installation and you still see the blue line where they will uh, weld uh, it further. So these were done actually by manufacturers from the ship industry and it was done really beautiful. Um, and then like Patrick showed already, um, it, she added her own furniture. And I think it's really nice because it emphasizes the space, these, these glass tables, you know, keeping it open and bright and it's completely different to what it was before and one really can enjoy the beautiful view out to to the ocean so that is a project so we were also involved and collaborated 
in as local architects for Collins Park uh, garage, and that it was a public project by the city. And so it was in 2012. And at that time, it was the thing in Miami to do parking garages. So, you know, if you look, uh, there's, um, you know, also this um, amazing garage done by Herzog de Moron. So they had basically a competition out for doing this parking garage. Um, and they invited Saha uh, to, to compete for this. And they presented this design of a parking garage, which is like one continuous loop. And uh, I remember that was in 2012 and we were all, you know, there was this conference room. We were all sitting there and you guys, Patrick and Saha were presenting and they were presenting this, this continuous loop, very simple. And they, asked, they looked at it and they loved it. And they said, okay, that's the project. And then they asked, okay, can this be built? You know, so for Miami, that was still a risky thing to build a continuous loop of concrete. And, you know, and then Patrick and Saha showed um, of all these projects that you had done in, uh, in China and, and in the Middle East. And it was an amazing thing actually to be in this room and to see, you know, and, and see also the building officials in Miami that they could see that something from a drawing can actually be built. So, you know, everybody was very excited, you know, it was commissioned the project and also further developed. So it was actually also interesting. It was this continuous loop. It was next to um, the museum and the library. So, um, so the idea was that the loop would spread over to the other side, over the street, and then be higher on, on, on one of the sites and create a park. So then that was then called Collins Park. Now the project, went on for three years. Patrick, you said I how to explain why it didn't go further. Well, I think it was a political shift, you know, at many levels. And the people on the people that were in the beginning there, there was nobody there three years later. And um, and then unfortunately it got cancelled. But it would have been a great project. So um, well, and that is her. Uh, she, she was a great force and catalyst in Miami. And I miss her dearly in Miami. Thanks. Thanks, Claudia. Um, beautiful. Um, I just, uh, maybe John, um, John Stewart, my other colleague of FIU, um, uh, maybe you'd like to kind of reflect. I know that you, that Zaha came to MBUS a couple of times. Um, on uh, maybe reflect on, on on your your impressions of of Zaha. Well, uh, <clears throat> no, I'm kind of uh, I'm, I'm almost choked up with Patrick and Claudia's uh, kind of reviews. It just reminded me of how um, what an important um, kind of force she was. I think Claudia used that word, um, and I was actually thinking back to the spiral that Claudia ended on. Um, it reminded me of the Hague housing uh, projects where uh, Zaha, one of the first projects that I worked on when I was in the office was a continuous house that had on every level a different um, you know, aspect of the house, the kitchen, the dining, the bedroom, um, beautiful, uh, beautiful drawings. But I, I, I'm sure um, that there were some earlier kind of you know, interest. This wasn't the first time that she was thought about the spiral and had been sketching it. She would sit in the office and sketch these spirals and they would kind of be coming together. But I think that that project that Claudia showed, um, the parking garage really maybe was the culmination of that, of, of a lot of that research and uh, that line of, of thinking. The only other thing I, I wanted to share, which was, Kind of personal. I would go over to um, to Zaha's spaces, and one at one point you, you didn't mention, but in the middle of that of that row of hotels was the setai. And I remember she used to stay in the setai, and she'd always stay in a in a an apartment that was high up. And I was, and I live in condos too, and so I was asking her why she likes to live in these, in why she likes to live so high off the ground, like in these in mm -hmm. these condos when she's in Miami. And she was mentioning that she really, she told me that she really loved the, this 
she had always been fascinated by this idea of flight and the and flying. And I don't know whether Patrick or Claudia, you really you ever heard that from her, but you know, I, I then started to think about that. And you know, if you go back to her very earliest, the peak project, the the peak competition, and you look at those the renderings as she was going through the peak, it was really kind of she was flying through that project and she was always kind of in the air looking at things and flying around it. Um, and I just kind of see that a, a lot of that coming together in the, um, in the work that she showed and even in the kind of, in the, the amazing vistas that you showed Patrick of the new tower mm -hmm. that was just like, you're just, you're part of, you're part of the sky, you're part of this larger world mm -hmm. and the larger world is conforming to your, uh, to your, kind of space. Um, and the last observation that I had, and I, I, I don't know if this is true or not, may, Patrick may be able to uh, shed some light on this, but when I was in the office, one of the, the, one of the most shocking things that I remember Zaha doing was taking a model that I had been doing, I think it was a wall in Berlin. It was, you know, hundreds of thousands of feet long and I had been thinking, and it, but I made a small model of it and she just kind of took the model and she wrapped it around her wrist and said, oh, this would make a great bracelet. And it was just, what was so shocking was her instant ability to switch scales <clears throat> and to think at multiple scales simultaneously. And while you were showing the, the and I, I, my, uh, my apartment looks out onto, onto her tower, so I see it every morning. Um, but I um, was wondering whether, at the time she was doing some very beautiful uh, jewelry uh, that had also a kind of skeletal, skeletal component to it. And I was wondering whether the, this idea that she could possibly be, be designing jewelry uh, and a huge skyscraper at the same time and hold them both in her head and kind of get them both produced was, uh, was part of this. Maybe you have something to, to say about that. That's all. Well, I, I was just- No, really actually she does have the spiral, the spiral uh, rings. Uh, and sp spiral chandeliers. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there's also the Tatlin spiral, which we, which we instantiated in the Guggenheim. Yes, I worked, that's the uh, project. Tried to, we tried to, in the end, pull, pull it off. And she loved mm -hmm. the Guggenheim itself as a, as an, as a concept. And uh, so, uh, But the yeah. skeletal, did she do some skeletal rings, maybe for some? Um, uh, I think, yes, we did gallery. skeletal jewelry, skeletal jewelry, yes, yes. yes. You yeah. did definitely this kind of a uh, big bracelet, which yes. looks it's more of a kind of porous layered, uh, like bony structures, a bit like the Macau um, mm -hmm. the skeleton as, as jewelry. So yeah, we, she always was in, interested obviously doing design across all uh, scales from all the way from urbanism into, um, you know, furniture, interior uh, products, as well as, as jewelry so, and fashion as well. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was the, because the way that she sketched and the, so, so this was, uh, the method was um, form to program and uh, the formal systems and, and, and intricate strange forms and then exploring their utilization. Mm -hmm. And there could be these sketches were oftentimes um, indeterminate with respect to their scale, but because of an indeterminate with respect to the project, they might be, uh, attached to or might be used for. So sometimes you're sketching for within the context of doing a competition, but also if there wasn't something right now, she just sketch anyway, and that would <laughs> could become anything. Uh, but also, of course, when the this whole idea of the drawing, these, these, these building up drawings, even on a particular project with lines, which are yet indeterminate whether these lines will end up just uh, divisions surface divisions on the floor or would be walls or would be uh, overhang roof overhangs um, that would also be left um, to be explored. So, so there were kind of graphic spaces and graphic structures that would then uh, slowly be interpreted into, into, um, into uh, more determinate and concrete elements. So she wouldn't start with thinking about this is a wall, this is a roof. It was only, it was more formal structures which evolved and then would be interpreted uh, by cutting the, you know, a, a cardboard and peeling up, peeling down or whatever. So, so that is a very strong, um, and I think it's, it's, it's important, this methodology, I mean, um, particularly in teaching as well. In teaching, it's easier to do that 
and because you don't have to have a determinate result for a client with very specific demands. So that's where we do always the formed program um, methodology. In an office, yes, we eventually we have to deliver. <laughs> but, but I mean, Zaha was not, you know, um, um, was more proliferating formal structures, uh, which could then be used in various ways and wasn't always precisely working on a particular um, project. As I said, but even if you do on a project, then you, there's various ways of, of interpreting uh, particular sketches. So, so, and that means also the indeterminacy of the scale with respect to function. And um, it's clear that this is um, um, uh, the way she always worked. I mean, um, um, even as a student. Yeah. Do you do you remember mm -hmm. Patrick? I, I seem to recall being there when she was when the office was just starting to use computers. Maybe Dan had just gotten like a first Apple. Is that correct? Or were they were they there when you were there, Claudia? Were they in the eighties? I don't remember. Um, no, we no we, we had nothing. Uh, we no. had no computers at all. Um, I mean, I I was got a little bit. I mean, I didn't have a computer, but I, when I was at school in eighty seven, I was using a computer. But but in the office we had nothing, and then yes, we in the end there was this little Mac purchased, and 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 then okay, <laughs> was working on it. So in the, in the, there was a whole period where we had parallel, where we did sketches and drawings and and computer sketches, which were then printed and worked over. But we didn't do any drawings. I mean, plans it was only three dimensional explorations, uh, which were done on the computer for the first few years, and then the final. Uh, when we had better computers, uh, I think it was 95 when I started to work and uh, do, do full drawings, full, full entries on the computer. Uh, up to then, we, it was, was, was a mixture. Um, um, but in the, in the 80s, we had zero computers. Zero, yeah. But I remember that when we were in the office, you know, that drawing was, was a major element to really develop the drawings. And like you were talking about this flying over, I think, you know, one of the great things what she was doing, I remember with Vitra, to look from far, to really not see just the site, to see the whole context and the city. And I think, you know, and then creating these drawings and in the connectivity with the, with the projects. And I think that beca the projects became then extremely successful, become like elements of the site. I think, yeah, it always strikes me as being so prescient to think about the environment as well as and everything around it, uh, as well as the building. I mean, we seem to be going there more and more as we're thinking about our environment more in a more resilient way. And just to kind of not to let your building be just an object in an otherwise untouched landscape, but to think about the way it impacts everything around it. And those are all systems that come together. John, can I, can I just make a point there? Sure. What I was really struck by was um, this idea of Zaha and flying. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, actually, I, I, I get this impression of Zaha almost like a butterfly, you know, coming into land somewhere. <laughs> um, and, you know, when I was a student, I've got to say, I studied at the University of Cambridge in, in the 80s. Uh, and I was so disappointed by what was happening. I'd seen the Sydney Opera House, you know. I'd been, I'd been really kind of uh, that had really. That's why I did architecture in some ways. You know, that and the combination of King's College Chapel. I, I thought that it was going to be inspiring. Instead, we was we were stuck in this kind of crisis of postmodernism, you know, when um, which seemed to be a kind of absolutely going backwards, you know, the complete opposite of what I was looking for. Um, and then Zaha comes along, you know, and in the most extraordinary way, you know, just lit things up. In an, an incredible way, and and then I think that was extraordinary in many ways. But she, she, in a way, she is in some senses like a butterfly in a sense, decontextualized in an interesting way. Because what I found interesting about the AA and also about her office was that it was in London. It is, and yet it was somehow 
not British. It was completely kind of deterritorialized in an interesting way and deterritorialized in terms of the ideas as well. She wasn't stuck in this kind of world that everyone else was was stuck in. And uh, it seems amazing that, well, I think the fact that she's doing it in Miami, which I think Miami Beach is very similar in the sense that it's a, it's a kind of place that is a very exotic space where, you know, Gianni Versace came to live and so on. It's And, 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 and it actually obviously fitted her perfectly. But there must be some extraordinary tensions that come out of, of, of being this, you know, exotic butterfly, as it were, landing mm-hmm. somewhere. I'm, I recall the, the, the project she did and she won the competition for an opera house in Cardiff. And um, this is before she started building very much. And it was such an amazing breath of fresh air. But then it got dismissed by the locals as some kind. I think it was called a deconstructed pigsty. And, and mm-hmm. you find yourself in this kind of tension of this most extraordinary individual who's coming in and, and, and in, a, in a context of often a very kind of parochialized uh, local uh, bureaucracy. Um, and I'm sure that as an office where you are operating absolutely completely internationally and then being stuck with kind of local bylaws and conditions, that must have been the biggest tension in sense in the office itself. So, I, I mean, it's very contextual in some ways, but also completely decontextualized. And that's the magic in, in a way of much of her work. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the, the loosening of the geometry, the idea of an explosion, for instance, where the fragments are flying in all directions. Um, she, she, it, it, that's part of that uh, flying thing. I mean, she used the phrase "the space of flying," and what and and uh, this was also uh, you know coming out of suprematism, and uh, she mm. uh, suprematism was at the, they were at the time already thinking about space flight, and some of these compositions are you know, unearthed. And uh, uh, in this kind of idea of hovering and, and the idea of um, a Sputnik and so on. she was into all of that and 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 um, so so but in particular the spaces we generated in Cardiff, for instance, there's this there's a space between um, uh, the the opera piece and the other uh, wrapping around piece. There's a there's a kind of oblique surface and then a series of cantilevering boxes. They're ponderated and shifted. And if you between those, you suspend it with variations and things below you, above you, and all around you, and that's the space of flying. And that's sometimes we call the she wants us kind of helicopter view or when you're you're hovering in mid air between buildings. Let's say you can do that in the Miami project I showed just just now, where you have th- little things, bridges here, overhangs here, and 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 this kind of layered. Also the the way we you know the floors, the cutaway and. And um, so, so we, we loved also Portman, both of us, with the atrium, particularly the, the Marriott in, 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 um, in, in New York, where you, where you have these different spaces. You, and the, the atrium is also you know, is opening up here. And so there's also a space of flying. And so we, we got very big, of course, in the, in the atrium <laughs> pursuit. Uh, uh, and, and that's the space of flying. So I picked up the phrase, the space of flying. She used it, and then you know something she finds in Leonidov, and there's all these perspectives where you have the towers and the and the aircraft overhead. Um, that's the world where this comes from, uh, where she got inspired. Of course, it's, it is very much in the peak as well. That's why the fascination with cantilevers as well, because when you're out on a cantilever, particularly there's another one above, you have you there's there's this kind of total freedom of where the view goes and. Um, and that's the fascination with that. Rather than having things framed and, and boxed in, it's this continuous flow of space. Um, uh, but that, which you find also in, in Mies and the Barcelona Pavilion and so on, but that then more three-dimensionalized. And Mies in the end got also it's far, more, far too kind of obsessed with the crystalline modularity and so on and lost that sense. But in initial, this the suprematist slash the style, ponderated composition, three-dimensionalized and dynamized, uh, um, is is this kind of um, uh, uh, the paradigm of architecture. We have we have um, our, our DDES students here um, uh, in the audience, so um, I'd like to also invite them to um, uh, ask some questions. Um, Marina, you, I know that you have one. 
Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Patrick. It was an amazing presentation. Um, I have a lot of admiration for your work and Saha's work as well. And uh, I, I want to make you a question. It's more a kind of a theoretical question. But I want to ask you in your book, The Autopoiesis of Architecture, you, in a way, let uh, outside uh, Gothic architecture uh, uh, in the definition of, the, of architecture. I mean, you say that in a way, uh, it doesn't have a theory because it doesn't have an author. And uh, however, uh, this idea of a structural expression that you use in the tower uh, takes or uh, refers a lot, I mean, it takes a lot from it, from uh, Gothic architecture. So in a way, my question uh, is, uh, what, is your, uh, what is your, or uh, if you know, uh, Saha relationship with this architecture in terms of uh, collaborative uh, authorship? Okay, so well, yeah, I mean, uh, if, if I, I was talking about the, um, I mean, what I'm trying to put forward is uh, to get an understanding of our discipline as discourse based and innovative, and, and, and where the drawing becomes this medium of speculation, which is a kind of historical takeoff. Uh, and you know, where this clear way, and it's also uh, ties in with when people say uh, you have to distinguish architecture from kind of some, some very ordinary, let's say, vernacular, uh, routine, tradition about building kind of uh, structures, because architecture is, is, is invention, is, uh, is, is imagination, etc., which, which you don't have in traditional uh, forms. And so the Romanesque. Medieval is, 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 is clearly this kind of vernacular it is. And then the Gothic is transition. But you don't have authors, you don't have, in, uh, you don't have uh, a, a design fully. And the, in the Renaissance, you have a complete design of buildings and, uh, um, a complete, and, and the discourse and the radical consciousness of innovation and so on. That doesn't mean that the, there isn't fantastic results in the, in, in, in the Gothic, which were more kind of intuitively, iteratively over hundreds of years kind of found through trial and error and um, empirically kind of evolved. Um, so it's it not a kind of value judgment, it just was meant to be a kind of a reflection on, on, on the distinctiveness of architecture, which as, as an innovative theory-led discipline which is also very much based on drawing and simulating, but transferring the kind of trial and error process onto the drawing, and it includes perspective. So you also can already visualize and, and, and explore the phenomenology and experiential quality of what you're doing. And also you have to convince, of course, many others. If you do something radically new, you have to make it tangible and compelling. That's what you need drawings for. So that's what, what I meant. But in terms of the structure, actually, it's interesting. So, so of course, the initial uh, world of Zaha had no much interest in expressing any structure. It was a world of flying plates and planes. She didn't mind a certain heaviness sometimes, or hovering. There wasn't an, an articulation in, 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 in structure. But when we, when we developed, I mean, in a way, the way this came into the discourse, uh, through um, um, for us Fray Otto. and you know so 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 as a as a, as a when, you know parametrics um, um, I mean her very fluid ever more curvilinear version of the deconstructivism and the space of flying when it became uh, computation empowered and then we we had to at one point uh, get into um, um, structuring this as well and so on. And there was a fascination with Flaw to, to have some very open and free form, irregular, uh, uh, and these open architecture exploiting kind of structuration. So she was into Flaw to, she was into Candela and, and these. And then uh, we, 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 we developed this in the university research with uh, also with, with, with skeletons. And so she got into it eventually. But it obviously isn't. Uh, wasn't initially her 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 thing. And something which evolved. I don't know when this started in the in the in the two thousands somewhere. 
Patrick, can I can I ask one, one thing? I mean, I, I the, the the Russian the suprematists and the Russian constructivists, I think, were absolutely crucial. Obviously, in many ways, I as a student, I I, I was fortunate to have Catherine Cook who took us out of that world of postmodernism. It's fantastic to, to have those insights. And I guess that the, the, the crucial figure in some ways in terms of Zaha's background at the AA must have been Rem Kohlhaas, who was um, you know, obsessed with these things um, and also actually taught Zaha, I think. Do you, do you want to say something about uh, what Rem... Well, it was actually, uh, of course, Rem and Ilya. Um, so, so they were both uh, her tutors. And um, I mean, originally Rem was Elia's student. And, um, but then I think there was a very close tension of it, which was Rem put on her work. And I think she learned an enormous amount. And at rest, the Russian stuff came through Rem. Uh, and Rem was in Moscow early. She then also made trips to Moscow later. So yeah, definitely that was, a, that was, was the Rem, um, um, uh, Rem and Elia influence. Can I um, ask, draw upon, ask the, invite the, the rest of the uh, DDA students to um, chip in and uh, make some comments? I have also uh, one question. First of all, I would like to thank you, Patrick and Zaha Hadid-Office for everything what you done for the industry and uh, for coming out with this magic and, and incredible ingredients for the formula of the successful building. And uh, every building which I visited in person made me feel always special. If it was um, residential, I felt like not in a, even a five star, but 10 star spaces. Uh, if it was commercial, it was always turning me ambitious. And I remember I was getting home and it was like productive work and work and work. And it was really like unique and creating this like special building environment. Um, when I met Zaha first time, I was very lucky in person in 2013. And of course, as Russian, we spoke about Russian suprematism and Russian schools of Hutamas and, um, you know, it was um, similar to Bauhaus, German Bauhaus, we had it in Soviet back in 1920. And a uh, year ago, I would like to speak a little bit about education. Uh, a year ago, you posted the 13th thesis on the crisis of architectural academy. And um, I'm curious what you also think about the disappearance of traditional craftsmanship from the academy. For example, the drafting skills. Um, currently, a lot of students, um, they have lack of drafting or sketching or understanding. For example, I would not imagine that modern students will understand this abstract Zaha Hadid uh, drawings or sketches. Then with implementation of computational design, I feel like a lot of students start to lack um, have common sense of understanding the building structures, the basic building structures, so, so they can come out with a fancy, beautiful, fantastic uh, models, but they don't understand the basic concept how to build the things. And also, I think another um, traditional craft which is lacking right now is the model making. And for us as an architect, it's uh, very important for understanding the spaces is to make the model. And this is like entire philosophy and meditation. When you make a model, you have additional time to think, to, to adjust and to make it. And also in uh, terms of the current condition when everything is remote, we don't have any more traditional office culture and traditional design studio culture. So what do you think is the perspective of the education when we literally almost globally one year working remotely and how it's, uh, what is the impact on professional development of the young professionals and students? So it was one question. And second question, do you think architecture should be more intuitive or rational? <laughs> well, I start the last one. I mean, I believe in uh, intuitions. Usually uh, they, are, they are mean something, they're, 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 they're evolved, they're built up, the way we kind of condition through experiences. And, um, but I be also believe in them, the attempt to rationally reflect and critically reflect and, and have them own, own those intuitions and understand why, why um, certain decisions are intuitively made and whether one can kind of rationally reconstruct them. So that's, so that's what I actually love. I've done that in some of my writings with respect to the fantastic, uh, it's intuitive uh, innovations, radical innovations that had delivered to the language of, 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 of architecture. And they seem strange and surreal, and, and, but what's the advantage 
for instance, of a free form curvature in terms of adapting to contingent site conditions of, of finding trajectories through complex spaces. So, you, so, so this kind of a crazy idea of, of, of making a freehand pulsating line and, and form and not just rationalizing it down to arcs, but literally trying to say that needs to be built. This is one of many uh, intuitive leaps which one needs to eventually needs to rationalize and understand why this was advantageous, good idea. Otherwise, it is easy dismissed. And also, um, it, it's just uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> so, so I think this is often in the division of labor. I mean, it's, it's uh, similarly with, you know, what's this fascination with gradients, with, 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 with bleeding one zone into another and so on. And then it needs to make sense of what's good about. How, uh, it's spaces which which might be not dissected upon crisp um, uh, boundary lines, but where maybe the, the the programmatic mix is gradually kind of migrating and changing, and that, that means that there's flexibility of usage across that 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 phase transition, for instance. So, so that, I've done a lot of that, where um, I, I trust also my own intuitions. And uh, that is also when you have a kind of developing an eye for something is balanced or not, and you know, uh, as as a first kind of guess of, of a structural soundness, and then you can uh, um, and and so so. But we can also sometimes um, uh, we, we we have to sometimes also correct our intuitions, um, certain aesthetic sensibilities if they are. In nostalgic or, or or locked into and um, prevent us from from uh, from um, opening up the let's say the uh, the morphologies to to new potentials of the contemporary if we have kind of if you have the, the wrong kind of uh, aesthetic investments or the wrong <laughs> intuitions so I think intuitions we can never get away from it because we can't, uh, we, we can't sit down and calculate and rationally uh, justify every single thing. So we need to work, rely on them, but then at critical moments, um, um, and let's query them. And then once we've kind of confirmed the rationality, that means the, the life enhancing advantageousness of certain, uh, this form, this certain ways of working, for instance, and certain uh, predilections and decisions, then you can kind of go back to them and feel comfortably comfortable in following these intuitions again. But but so I don't wouldn't I think there needs to be this dialectic between intuition and rational uh, critique. And in the end, um, um, if you if you don't have rational critique and argument, you you just have clash of intuitions. So, so then, but the rational discourse can resolve uh, those clashes. The other thing is, with respect to drafting, I've maybe I think I can recommend to students to maybe to, I mean, I think that, that everybody is still kind of sketching in one way or another on, on the site, whether it's over print or, or, or loosely. So, I, but elaborate draft, drafted artifacts, I don't think there will be much time for that. I mean, the students have, it's, it's, student life is short. And there's only so much you can, um, you can pack, pack into this. So I think that, that maybe it's becoming a master drafter and, and, and as a teenage years are better for that. I mean, that's when I learned just to draw. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and so, so I don't think we can afford uh, that time in the, in the, in the, in the, in the university curriculum. Patrick, it's just one thing. I mean, I, 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 I completely get the intuition thing. But the other thing is, though, that, that I always get the sense with the work coming out of your office that even though it's drawing upon this kind of um, intuition, this uh, and this sense of free form, that it actually it's very precise. In other words, a curve cannot be anything but another, but, but what it is. It reminds me almost of Alberti, you know, uh, what is beauty. It's, it's something from which you, can, uh, you, you can't, Take anything away or add anything, but for the worse. And and so it's almost as though I, to my mind, it's almost like the work of your office is almost classic in that point of view. Is, is that fair or? Well, yes, because well, 
it's true. When, I mean, I mean, it's still something which which has underlying rationality. I mean, if you know, it's, it's it is, and it ties into drawing. If you want to draw a person in in a dynamic position, you want to get some kind of dynamism. You want to get a balance, a poise, and you can see whether that's right or wrong, and and, and that's quite subtle. Um, so you see it when you, and you, that's why you need to, 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 to find those lines. It's more of a, the, the eye than the hand. It's a kind of selective process. And, uh, and the same as when you, when you compose in Maya and so on. I mean, you have, to, it's easier because when you have splines and, 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 and nerves, they, they already have a, a mathematical kind of a structure, which you, which you, which is pleasing. Uh, rather than, uh, and, but you also get this when you run the hand fast. So, so, so this, the, 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 the secret for of Zaha's incredible, beauty, beautiful drawings and that kind of shortness is the rapidity because if you have rapid hand movement, you have actually the physics of the, you know, the centrifugal, you know, whatever, the, that, that you get the physics into the drawing. If you do, if you do this, uh, then you have to do thousands of lines. Zaha was able to put one brush stroke down, and you know because it's it's it's, it's like writing. It's a beautiful handwriting, calligraphy, and that's the way she's put. But that means also you that needs to you, you can't it it needs to be it can't be scaled. It can't be fitting into something particular. But it's in it's it has its internal logic, and you get that through through. Uh, um, through in, in in through the through the force of the actual pulling the, the hand across, and then also the pressure, uh, you know, um, the, the the brush pressure and the the, 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 the you know the, the, as the ink kind of fades off, these are all laws of physics, and that and, and the similar in the computer when you use um, Maya and tools like this, they're kind of inbuilt laws of physics, and we are sensitive to the the, the ordering. Uh, 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 law, the lawfulness, lawful differentiation you find in nature through through physical processes, and that's why w w that's uh, um, where we get uh, the sense of it's vulnerable to you know you can get it wrong if you if you want to kind of invent those lines by patching them up out of dots and not using Maya, not using then you have to um, you need to rely on your eye. But you can find it in the first in the first stroke. So so, and we have very we have very kind of learned eyes. You can see what uh, you know um, 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 what's a a formation which is coming out of a force field, or what's the kind of um, garbage heap or junk crashed up, munched up piece of disorder. Because that's where we had we had a fifty or hundred uh, non-correlated events, kind of killing kind of a structure, uh, right? Because there's no connection. I mean, if you have a nice water washing down the beach, you get the beautiful ripples. If then a truck rolls over, or is five other events, randomly disconnected events, kill that uh, beauty. And then we look at it, then you you you, you know. It's, so yes, there is. There is this kind of precision, it's a sensitivity to this that these curves are uh, have that kind of tension uh, and 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 right kind of um, flow. Of course, there are many versions of that you could get right, but there are there, there are many 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 more versions where it could be wrong. Can I just follow up? There's one question. One thing about Zaha is she studied architecture after she studied maths, and I'm always intrigued by those with the background in mathematics. I mean, Alan Turing has got a background in mathematics. Chris Williams also. We, we saw him Digital Futures last last uh, Saturday. I mean, he has this sense that the the elegance and the simplicity of a sine wave or something. You know, you can if you can be very precise. Do you think her Zaha's background in, in in mathematics had any impact on the way she used to think? Uh, I don't know to be quite frank. So I, I wasn't uh, when well, well, if, ever since I met her, she wasn't uh, into mathematics. She she wasn't into geometry, of course, but not not mathematics. I mean, I studied mathematics, but that, that, that was, it was this was the time was it's more of a kind of a logic uh, calculus and 
proving theorems kind of uh, a world and, and, and not so much the world of geometry. Well, I felt yeah, that I was incredible shock. You know, she, you know, so things were complex. You would just synthesize it sometimes into one idea. It's very focused. You know, I, I think when you, I, you know, one of these, the, what's the name of the project in Wolfsburg that you guys did, the Science Museum, Faena? Yeah, yeah. so, you know, I went there when it was nearly done and it's, it's an amazing building. It's actually extremely built, simple. It's a floating huge box and it's holded up by these structures that are like cones, you know? And so the idea is extremely simple, but the geometry and the flow and the movement is very complex, like the way how you go in, and that's how you experience the space. And I think often when, so like Saha would sketch, I think it was sort of intuitive, but also extremely rational. I mean, she would exactly in one movement understand what would be the idea or the concept. So I think uh, Sa had that capacity. So maybe studying math has a certain logic that translated, you know, later into creating these kind of, you know, systems and understanding of the project. And it was always also very much about space making, I think. I have a question. Hi, Patrick. Um... To Miami, I cannot really uh, say too much. I just remember one anecdote when Saha was coming to a review at to Angewandte, and she walked in with magenta flip flops, which had even heels. So that was really she was bringing this this joy and 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 playfulness also to Vienna. So that was great. So my question actually is more like related to the discussion on the digital futures, uh, actually from last year and like. Where do you see, um, and also what we're discussing here in Adidas, uh, um, where do you see AI and machine learning, um, like, like, a, like a little bit of your outlook and how you're using it at, at the office? Because we've seen like the Timo Blau and Tom Main like using it on, a, on an aesthetical level, like, like harvesting their archives and drawing and looking for new aesthetics. Um, or you see it more in a resilient term that you can like you know like like uh, life cycles of buildings and learn about the uh, buildings or uh, you see it more in an optimization um, as kind of a next grasshopper or like I mean just like you're at the very now what is what is where, where, where you see well, at the moment, it's more in the teaching arenas, AA, etc., um, where we get into it. I mean, we optimization, of course, is is, is very important. Um, we we do it. We do. Uh, it, I mean, this kind of particular um, image-based uh, GAN proliferation and 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 spiral uh, blending, etc. We are not at the moment doing that. I I'm interested, though. I think it's an interesting. Uh, technique to to proliferate potentials. Um, overall, I think in in all in all aspects, uh, more in the exploratory side, but also in the kind of uh, optimizing and rationalizing side of things, AI could be become more and more important. So to to sort out very complex um, program arrangements and optimizing for adjacency um, matrices, uh, adjacency matrices which you build up. Um, um, it could be path optimization. I mean, we also do these kind of uh, agent-based life process modeling where we're using kind of gaming AI uh, utility functions for, for agents. And we're now also starting to use it for, um, let's say, what are called creative spontaneous environments where various elements of the architectural systems, uh, partitions or, or doors or furnishings have some kind of uh, reinforcement learning of, of their um, behaviors, the way they respond or actively uh, um, seek out their own util utility maximization I mean, or their own best utilization uh, through, through, through the human agents. So that these are interesting, I think, uh, ways forward on both on the functionality of things, which obviously have a, has an impact on, on morphologies and form, 
indirectly. So then you just take up whatever forms you, you, you this will take as well as on the direct form, form proliferation. So I'm very positive. I mean, we can't do everything. Um, um, we have uh, two research departments already doing, uh, uh, having various multiple research, let's say agenda, still working on geometry optimization on fabrication, on, uh, gamification on of, and participatory urbanism, uh, life process modeling. And now we're working on VR and um, this idea of a uh, um, cyber incubator, meaning we, we were working on simulating uh, virtual environments for communication. So we have already a, a, a full, a full, <laughs> um, um, uh, a full kind of schedule. So, 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 in which machine learning plays a part in some of them, not the kind of uh, AI uh, which, uh, for instance, uh, Neil Leach. Neil is interested in and uh, um, uh, and um, some of this, which happened that I see now with, in, in Miami with Bolian. So, so we're not into that, but I'm very keen uh, observer of that and hope that something's coming out of that. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Rethik Anadol's been been um, trying to generate um, these kind of things using uh, a database of of, of of your work and it's been really? yeah it's been super I, I, I've got an image on the front cover of my book okay, no, okay. I'm curious about it. yeah I mean, I'm very key I'm very curious and interested in this I but I think I think the what the I guess that it's probably wolf um uh, that has been pushing it most um with yeah I've seen that yeah 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 I wonder if I can I can ask you a question about uh, something that was mentioned earlier. I think uh, about complexity. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It's wonderful to see the world and uh, the work. And most of the times, when I, when I see uh, Zahas and your work, I, I the word complexity come comes into mind. It seems to be like, almost like a vernacular way of describing the shapes and both both in in. And my apologies, I'm not an architect. I will try to speak about form and shape, so I hope I do it okay. Uh, both in, in the shapes, we call them complex, and also I can imagine in how they are built, how they are designed, how they are fabricated, and it's always a complex thing, right? And I remember in one of your talks that I remember, uh, yeah, I think you, you were speaking about uh, Luhmann, and he had some interesting ideas. And I think that the idea of his that I like most is how he defines complexity. And I, th I think he, he, you'd, he would define it as a system that you can no longer connect all, all the, the relationships in there. So that's how he would define the complexity, let's say threshold, right? And I wonder, do you think that your projects are this type of complexity? Because I also saw some continuation, some you know, connections through spaces. Like wh what type of complexity do you think your projects are? Well, I mean, the, the thing is that, uh, of course, uh, Complexity arises out of um, an explosion of combinatorics, and and let's or let's say uh, the way in a building you you get complexity if many spaces communicate with many other spaces and uh, in con uh, in uh, connections through vistas through uh, similarity that you kind of associate them with each other through uh, through contiguity uh, through alignment. So this this kind of uh, let's say multiplicity and and um, density of relations, rather than having only one relation, a grid, or having only uh, uh, having things disconnected, that I wouldn't call complex. So so we are striving for this kind of complexity, but we want to maintain legibility in the face of complexity. Um, so they should be legible and and retrievable and, and and become transparent that com that complexity. Um, and that's why we need to reflect on, you know, the, the cognitive capacities of, of, of users and in the, actually in the way that is the problem of complexity is what, what I believe in retrospect, what uh, killed deconstructivism or made us move from deconstructivism into what was later called parametricism, because in deconstructivism, you get that, um, Complication, let's say, I wouldn't call it complexity, 
of many things uh, layered on top of each other randomly and um, you allow any angles and, and shapes and superimposition and intersecting things and so on. And, uh, but in the end, you, you get lost in your own drawing. So there's, there's a lack of, there's no order anymore. Uh, and that's not uh, what, I, what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a complex variegated order. And for that, you need to set up relationships, but we can comprehend maybe many simultaneous relationships and, uh, and have that rich complexity without this order. So in particular, if you work with the parametric modeling and where you have, maybe it's always about setting up correlations, it's always about having dependency relations. Every, nothing is brought in and is a kind of um, uh, without, uh, in, everything is brought in through, if you bring everything in through a script that is always dependent on what's there and, and, and is, in a, is a function of what is there. And then you can trace back. And that's the way you build order. When you just throw things, together, then you don't have that and legible complexity. Either. And uh, you don't have the relatedness. You have maybe many elements, but you don't have relationships or relations anyway, not any not relations you could retrieve or you could um, rely on others getting and retrieving. And you can have trivial, you have thousands of relations, but you can make, uh, these will be ad, ad hoc uh, descriptions. That's not, not of interest. Can I just add one thing, uh, Patrick, you might remember yeah. when Zaha was first invited to the uh, Deconstructivist show, she was, she was just shocked that she was even being considered in this group because <laughs> for exactly the reasons you were just saying, she said, I'm not, you know, there's no, there's no disorder or chaos in her world. It was a very kind of complete and well understood through sketching and through the drawings, all the things we've talked about, but uh, in, you know, and then I think the the desire to be part of that show, uh, you know, for many reasons kind of overcame this initial pushback. I, I remember hearing it in the office, but uh, you I'm probably sorry. did too. In, in, in both cases, we are talking about complex, complexity in a representative way. We are talking about if the drawings are complex or are not complex. But in a way, can we architects escape, escape to the complexity that every building is when you build the building, the building, is complex, not complicated, because complicated is another thing, but it's complex in a way. And when you say, uh, Patrick, that uh, you prefer uh, legibility in a way you have to choose and you prefer legibility, you are talking more uh, about a formal thing. For example, in the tower, you decided to make it symmetrical. I mean, it's a symmetric building, but anyway, the context is not symmetrical. So the building, every face of the building have to interact in terms of material performance, in terms of exchange of energy, it has to, to mediate with the context in different ways, every, every phase. So it's, a, it's almost impossible to escape to this complexity. Uh, just uh, to, to add yeah, to the what discussion, you mean, what, very what, controversial, what it, but. <laughs> I mean, what, what I think what I realized is, is we, we, we would like to, it's nice what you're saying that, let's say if, if, if there's a building and each facade faces a different context. Ideally, these facades should reflect that and become differentiated. I would believe that. That would be, uh, in principle, at least something a hypothesis one could consider. And at the same time, these four facades are still part of the same building. So they would have to be similar to the different contextual configurations, as well as similar to each other. And that's what we call kind of multiple affiliation. And you can do that. Something could be similar to different things which themselves share very little, but we can always find things which are shared between different elements. So I believe that is the case. I, I don't think technological under the hood complex, complexity is of interest. Let's talk about design complexity in terms of what the final experience is. And if there's a complex life process with multiple audiences, with multiple simultaneous event, and the building is exposed to different sites and has did multiple entrances, then it is already multifaceted. So, so, so the, each entrance should look, maybe you know, there's a big and wide one and a narrow one and so on, but there should also be a family of entrances which show at least that you recognize um, these are all part of one building and the different parts of the building. You should sense that if, if this is a unity of functioning together. So if the different space in the building and different parts 
of buildings and a complex of buildings, if they are, if there's a, there must be a reason why they are put together. You know, the institution has multiple parts. It's still an institution. So, what I'm saying is, there's this, there's always this kind of functional unity, and that should be expressed through through the language of architecture that you understand that these different parts belong together, as well as understanding it, that they're different from each other, as well as that each of the parts maybe has a particular affiliation to a context, if that you know one of the lobbies is opposite another lobby and these, these two share something, or maybe there's a retail element in the lobby, so that connects up to the retail down the street. So, so this, these multiple relations, you should try to articulate all of them. I mean, you, I mean, you have to kind of select, it's a bit that thing, you, you know, not everything is related to everything equally, but many things are linked to many other things. And that's the game. And uh, that's the interesting game. So because of life is complex, the buildings can be complex. If there was a super simple life, uh, only one event, only one uh, you know, um, um, uh, ever repeating uh, uh, event with the same people, uh, then you could have a simple, uh, very simple space. Um, which you know, it's a kind of simple church space where every Sunday the same thing happens for hundreds of years and you don't need uh, then there's no complexity required. There's only one entrance and so on. And then there is, a, a, and in a way, all of these complexities, you shouldn't have technical elements come in the way. If there's a chimney, suppress it because the chimney is not of interest. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an element too many. It doesn't have any separate social functions. That's my thinking, kind of, it's, an, it's a, a suppression of irrelevant differences and an accentuation of uh, differences which make a difference, and to, at the same time understanding the unity of the of the of the various elements. And that this is non-trivial, you can see. For instance, an example is the Bauhaus building, which has the different parts quite distinctly articulated, but they're all kind of modern. But still, it's it is potentially disorienting if you come from the building from one side, it looks very different from the other. That these different parts actually belonging all to the Bauhaus, particularly if other buildings are around it, it might fall apart. There's always a danger that the, the composition falls apart. And if you give up on symmetry, if you give up on proportion, because it would be too constraining, because symmetry is maybe, as you said, maybe not justified. Uh, um, uh, what else do we have? That's what one of the things we have is this kind of uh, equilibrium composition. Yes, you do something asymmetric, but you're ordering it around a, a center of, supposed center of gravity where this kind of big bulk here is balanced by this larger thing here and this cantilever here. Then, you, and at least you sense that this overall thing is a kind of, uh, would, be, would be a stable mobile. Then it has a center of gravity and that, that ties together the elements which belong to that. And somehow, so, so this is another composition and that's my, you know, this is the way I'm rationalizing. Modernism throughout proportion and symmetry, but it maintains strongly the ponderated composition, the balanced composition. I mean, that's what they've, that they taught at the Bauhaus. That was uh, um, um, uh, Mies in Chicago had the students created composition out of multiple buildings parts. And the, the game was to have a balanced composition. What does it mean? It means there's a sense of unity. The thing isn't falling apart. Why? Because it is a kind of as if uh, uh, ordered balanced around the center of gravity point. Just an example. So these are, there are many other ordering uh, unifying techniques, gradients which run across something um, and other kind of resonances and scripted affiliations um, where you could have differences. I mean, I like a lot, I mean, it's, it, it, maybe it's interesting to not have a full on symmetry, but, but use a kind of broken symmetry. Where, where there is something mirrored, but in a strange and distorted way on the other side, where they're not the same, but they're kind of correlated. Um, and there's many ways of, of, of holding together a complex building and not allowing the composition to fall apart because when the composition falls apart it means there's disorientation. Patrick, can I quickly show um... <clears throat> something. Um... I just want to say one thing. That is what we're obsessing about. Let's say we've laid it out, we've, the functionality is clear, but that's 5% of the work. And then there's 95% of holding, the, making a composition work and tying it together with uh, and, and, and honing it to, 
the, it's legibility. And then when you do all these perspectives, you, each vista is also trying to bring all these elements together and not having a clutter, not letting, letting any space fall apart and any vista fall apart. And that's nearly impossible. There will always be views where the thing falls apart. Yeah, I'm here today. Sorry, I put me to put myself. Can I just very quickly uh, share something? Um, uh, to show you precisely what um, this is, this is a, <clears throat> an image of that was generated by um, Refik Anadol using style GANs. And it was using a database of um, of your, your the work from the office, and of course it was part of a kind of a latent walk, as it was it kind of it's part of a video, as is that. But you can capture at one particular moment something that actually, to my mind, kind of resonates with my impression about what the work of the office was. And I guess that the the possibilities that that, that I mean, Tom Main and, and Wolf Pricks, are, I mean, they have slightly different approaches. They're both interested in the possibilities of AI. And I think for, for Tom Main, it's about opening up the kind of search space beyond those things that you might initially have thought about but as a kind of combinatorial exercise. Um, and uh, and Wolf picks something different to that, but, but similarly kind of almost like a sort of like treating AI like some kind of muse that might inspire you and open up the possibilities of what things might be. Um, yeah, I like that. I mean, it's a nice, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's something we should look into, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question in, in the chat here. Um, um, uh, a question about sustainability. To what extent um, does sustainability um, come into the, the, the project in Miami and elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, um, what, what I'm looking for is um, ideally, Let's say there's this element which is about a bit of you know uh, embodied energy where you choose a certain concrete which is going to recycle and I mean these are just decisions you do that is that they have a certain um, 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 you know value and that's where you get certified for and 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 we do those of course and. The other the thing which is more interesting from, from an architectural point of view, we, we actively seeking out and drawing in and and and, and you know is, is where you have passive systems where you where you work for instance with uh, with relief and shading um, 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 and uh, where you, where we work with um, um, climatic uh, um, um, let's say adaptability with respect to uh, uh, regional conditions, local conditions in the Middle East very strongly with, with, with because you have more harsh and more extreme climates. And Miami is very mild, I mean, this is, but you, you have, of course, heat. And that's why, you know, the, the, the balconies help a lot with the, with the, with the shading. Um, 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 right there, but in, let's say, the more, more interesting uh, projects and in in the Middle East, where we where we looking for having a stronger impact on the morphology, coming out of the idea, for instance, of allowing spaces to be ventilated and shaded at the same time, and to minimize the use of machine. I mean that's that's that 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 helps a lot quantitatively later on, but it's also exciting because it is it is it, it is shaping the form in in interesting ways, and it also is a a parameter force, which is, which I think in, in our Saudi project is quite quite in, in several of our Saudi projects. These are very interesting. Uh, curious, giving a curious kind of character for this to, to the project. The very kind of deep cut windows, um, the whole courtyard morphology, the same idea of orienting a courtyard with, with asymmetrically towards the wind and away from the sun, that same shape is in the solid courtyard and in the tensile roof part. So now you have the ontology of a solid a built, concrete built and the tensile, and they both do 
uh, a, a, a have a certain the oculus sh uh, uh, let's say tilted and that means they become similar and more unified formally while they're both doing uh, have a certain purpose there's also a certain ori orientation in the overall field which they, which is all shared so these are the things we like because it, it is it gives the whole thing more structure more order a peculiar form a lawfulness of to the form similar to the way we like the structural morphologies to come through and giving a little kind of organic orderedness to it and variation so so we do very much like um, environmental uh, engineering logics passive systems learning from the vernaculars of the world where before we had all these machines uh, with their different cultures evolved interesting building morphologies which we kept ahead could sustain a degree of comfort without massive energy, well, usually without any energy. So this is very interesting to me, architecturally. Now that, that, that of course, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the other things which, which lead to a kind of platinum or uh, gold lead, platinum lead, they are, uh, you know, they're, they're coming through the engineers. But also when it comes to, uh, Energy savings, this is also very important for the architects in terms of saving all that space for all the heavy machine. And that's also quite a study to the huge machines in the room for in the big machine rooms in the facade. And this is also a, or big kind of energy blocks outside your building. None of this is nice. So the more you do uh, of, of, of light footedness, the more space uh, i mean they don't you know you have um if you can naturally vent and avoid all these kind of massive cavities for ducts and so on uh this is this is all for so you could you <laughs> in the pursuit of 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 beauty uh and 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 user friendliness is is coincides with the sustainability agenda that's the bits which i like just one of the questions I, that I want, I, I find intriguing about the office um, is the way that it relates to the DRL. I mean, it's, I think it's astonishing that on the one hand, you've got design research laboratory, research in it, in the title. And then you've got a kind of research unit going in the office, the, the code uh, with Strage and so on. And there is this incredible bond um, between the two, in a way, because Sharjah like, is teaching on the DRL as well. Um, to what extent does um, do, does the office rely upon? Well, it's not only uh, uh, Sharjah. I mean, we have another team now with Tyson, and we have also XDRL. We have um, uh, the the DRL feeds into the designers uh, more. I mean, of course, feeds into Sharjah also. But everybody in code was a former DRL, but. But in our front end design is ma massive amounts of uh, XDRL. Uh, so that's still happening. We're still hiring because, because, um, um, because they're skilled up with what we need. And um, so it's not only researchers, we need always designers. And what we do in DRL is, uh, is we're doing very complex designs. And they're not easy to, um, it's it's good that you that that we have a chance to teach for 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 sixteen months, and then we pick up the, the best people. I mean, then I wish we had always uh, that expansion that we can always absorb <laughs> the lot. Sometimes we did it. Sometimes we did the whole the whole group. Um, but we this year we also we we're still expanding, so we're going to hire again. But Vienna was also very good, a very good stream, the masterclass. So, so that was for 15 years feeding in from Vienna and now for 25 years feeding in from DRL. So that's very important. You would mention the term skilling up. So do you see the DRL as a kind of skilling up process for preparation? It's skilling up as well. It's also the other way. For, but what, what is very important, both Vienna and DRL, is, is for us to, for me and uh, Shaje, um, to... Um, and Theo, of course, as well, but let's say in terms of the perspective of the firm, to try out ideas, which we are also thinking about in the company. Uh, and uh, so, so um, um, 
that we 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 do as i said for instance the miami tower the whole skeleton research we did that first at the drl and at in vienna for some years and so on and then we did a lot of competitions similar we did you know we have done all these tensile and shell structures in the office i mean we that was paralleled with research at drl so it's design and in vienna as well so so we're trying out a lot of things new things because in a firm um you have to be much quicker uh, you know, to to come to a very tangible result so this kind of idea proliferation is is better done in the schools so so that's what this is um, um, a lot about and then the training comes along uh, automatically uh, with that maybe can i jump in to ask question sure yeah all right uh, hi, Patrick. Uh, really nice to see you here. Um, uh, yeah, and I'm uh, really congratulations for this amazing project uh, that you showed today. Um, I remember I was also working on some of the sketches. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, really glad to see that uh, happen, uh, like really realized, yeah. Um, I just want to go back to a few slides, earlier slides of your presentation. Um, and from uh, from my understanding, especially about the first page that you showed with uh, different projects in one page, comparing and, and um, uh, with also the Miami Tower, um, that um, the interesting thing about that page is that all the other projects in that page was uh, relatively smaller scale and they are uh, probably very different from uh the, most of the other projects are a little bit uh structurally pure because they are small scale relatively uh mm -hmm. um but i i understand that miami tower uh, especially in that page was showing on um, the pure if i understood correctly showing the pure architectural elements without any uh additional uh uh decorative elements that purely that architectural elements are uh, revealed in the appearance of the facade uh, itself. And I think that kind of achieved quite successfully in, in the outcome. And I, I kind of understand maybe that's what you are, uh, your ways of understanding or, or talking about uh, what tectonic, tectonism is. And I'm wondering what is the next uh, milestone of that uh, in the office? and whether is if there are any other kind of uh, early sketches that you are also looking into to build in the future. Well, I mean, is is tectonism is a very ambitious uh, paradigm, particularly when you do large projects, because it relies on uh, these kind of um, engineering logics and fabrication logics to drive the uh, drive the the architecture. Um, in the big, um, so it's rare that you can do a big project like this. I mean, the biggest would have been the Tokyo Olympic Stadium, where we had uh, this com interesting com combination of shell arched st structures and then tensile as secondary in that. So that was built out of that research and was, was an attempt to, to writ large. We have some new stadiums coming out where there is uh, a very beautiful, strong structural morphology at play. So that will come out. On the on the on the skeleton towers, I mean, we it's it's very um, we we had to pull back a little bit. I mean, I'm I'm trying to think about consciously bring it back. I mean, it would be nice. Um, um, it's just it's 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 a tough one uh, cost wise to um, to. Um, to bring bring forward. I mean, we had we had some setbacks where we had. Um, skeleton versions of towers, and in the end, it became a curtain wall, and so on, or or or, or le less expressed the structure. Um, so so, uh, but that's not over for me. And then again, the the, uh, the other uh, um, tectonism element, of course, is you can do with facade. So if you if you have a really good uh, um, parametric differentiation of uh, uh, shading relief. If that's if that's you know modulated in particular with respect to the different sun exposure conditions, and if you you know if there's an, an, a set, a sh over 
shedding from another building that this kind of bleeds through these kind of things I would consider under tectonism. So it would be an environmental logic or if you go in with fabrication, I mean, you have smaller elements, hot wire cutting or 3D printing uh, with, with all these kind of, you know, the, the tool paths is being visible or the, the particular geometries. I mean, what the point here is that before we had only nerve surface, now we have many more complex. We have these kind of connex surfaces. We have, uh, you know, the, the, the particular geometries coming out of hot wire cutting, for instance, or the particular geometries coming out of um, inflates or tensiles, they're all subtly different. Um, they're, they're, they, you know, then with the seaming line. So, so all of that is for me tectonism, where the, where, the, where the morphology is coming directly out of an optimizing, structural optimization or environmental uh, uh, optimization. And that's, I think, very powerful. And, but to, to pull that off in larger projects is still a challenge. So, um, and it reminds, you know, it, 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 I have to kind of remind myself, <laughs> good that you're reminding me of this, you know, because when, when every new competition comes up, is there an opportunity here? What, how can we, um, can we kind of push this paradigm for, forward? And, and to some extent we do it because also code is taking in more jobs you know, working with beautiful timber structure at the moment, the, the Roatan project is a code project um, where, where, where some of these uh, features are coming through, but it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not an easy one to pull off um, on, on larger projects, on fast paced projects. I have one more question. Um, since we're yeah. in the American school right now for the university, I'd like to ask you a question of what is your general impression about American architecture and how American client developer is different from others? Does he have any specific demands or requests? <sighs> well, I mean, I think that in, in America you have a particular I mean, America and Europe are different in the sense that you have these large commercial firms who, uh, who have, don't have, um, have a, um, a kind of architectural core or sensibility or DNA or soul. Um, and, and they're more, too much commercially driven. And uh, we are facing the, up with these firms in the international competitions very tough because they can, they're out, they're under bidders severely. So that we can only win these works uh, in, in China and elsewhere if we, if we, if, if we can compel and co we convince the, uh, the client that it's not the same. Um, so, it's, so, so you have a lot of these big firms against us and, and, and SOMs and KPFs. I mean, they do, they do unbelievable bulk unbelievable amount. Not that these projects aren't always, that they sometimes hit on a good project, but that's not, that's more of an accidental that a particular architect in this firm around a particular project develops an ambition. That's not something which is, which is in the system. So, so and, and in Europe, you don't have, you, you have different firms who have the kind of ideological direction, a research agenda, a, a, an artistic um, and intellectual kind of um, project. I mean, you have those in America as well, but, but, um, but do, they tend to be done much smaller. And can you also name, uh, please, for example, top three cities which we have to watch uh, from emerging from architectural point? in the future from architectural and technological points? Well, I mean, at the moment, it seems the world is relatively stagnant, um, except for China. I mean, our work is all in China, but the cities are so vast. It's, it's, <laughs> it's also, you know, it's a drop in the ocean whenever you do something very special in these places. But I think Shenzhen is, a, is, is very powerful. Um, it, 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 also, the quality is very high now, Shenzhen.
Patrick, one thing I, I wanted to ask you about, because I mean, you're very unusual in many ways, because you're, you're a kind of practitioner, but very interested in theory, and also interested in kind of like, in, say, academic research, because you did a PhD alongside the practice, and you've been involved also in a couple of programs, PhD programs that I've been involved in, the European Graduate School one, which is a kind of like a, yeah. it's a kind of a, where you can you can work in practice and do a PhD, and 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 so too the one in, in Tongji. Um, uh, it, what do you see now, the role or uh, how do you see doctoral education, because this is a doctoral program, and, and the increasing in need in some ways or, or otherwise to, to engage with this kind of um, a doctoral level research? I think it's important. I mean, I have, I have um, there, there's, I mean, I generated some of uh, uh, doctoral um, students also before I uh, came to uh, outside EGS and outside Shanghai in, in terms of the Vienna, using Vienna because I'm still a professor, I mean, without pay, but uh, so I had, uh, and I got a, a, also this, this small research grant and I had a number of people um, um, uh, working there because I felt that for the for some of those uh, researchers, in particular the agent-based uh, paramedic semiology that project, I've done a number of illustrative studios at, at Vienna and at DOL, and then to deepen that uh, and to to make it real, to bring it up into a properly uh, functioning simulation tool uh, isn't feasible. Uh, so 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 that's why the PhD is very good. To you can do more. You get the best uh, minds. You get them for longer. Uh, this was three years. Not that everybody kind of fully sustained it, and then we we, we blended that into into the office as a, as another research department. So, so the PhD is 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 very good in um, picking up things which maybe you can illustratively and, and 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 first kind of sketch up and explore in in a, in a master degree studio, but then to really have to to really work something through which 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 becomes usable and has actual results. Uh, that's what you need the PhD for. And um, I think it's very important that we have that because we, we don't have, most firms don't have research and it's very uh, difficult. I mean, we have, we have a, a sizable research now, a group, a total of 20 people. So that's quite, quite strong. Um, but we have 450 people, so this is, is rare to have that. We would like to expand our research, but and we, of course, this research group is also then working partly on projects. It's, it's only 50% pure research, and the other 50% is projects, but they're kind of manifesto projects, particular research oriented projects, which not necessarily are high profit projects. But that's rare. I mean, so the, the university and the PhDs are still the necessary. Uh, if we had more large firms who all had research departments, then this would be less necessary. I mean, a firm like Foster obviously has, has a lot of research groups and they're also very good and important. Um, but uh, um, even for us, um, I think in the end, the research uh, team in the office, which uh, turns out to be more potent than, than the PhDs at the university, is just more directed and you get, you get um, a more, uh, maybe there's more pressure to, to succeed and you get more, less isolated. I mean, I tried to, I mean, what, 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 what turned out of the risk, I don't know, but in, in, in Vienna had this team, of course, but they all did their own thing still at the same time. Uh, it's a lot of freedom. You don't have to show up every day, um, far from it. <laughs> so, so you totally rely on individuals. And we did a lot. I mean, I came out there and we had sessions, so it was good. I'm not saying it wasn't. But, but, but I think it's, it's still very important. With the next step, uh, more productive even, I think, is the, is the research department. But, they're not, they're not in abundance. So 
So definitely university PhD is a very important stepping component in the overall, let's say, progress of the discipline. We've got a question from Marina, but just can I just yeah. ask a final question first before before I, uh, I pass on? And that is, I mean, you are unique as a theorist. I mean, and that's that's what you're describing as kind of applied research, very much so. You know, so what role do you see for theory still in in in, in architectural practice? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's very important to to have an overall framing and overall direction to to understand what to 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 guide the judgment of which direction, which paradigm is. Is, is valid, valuable to be invested in, and also to tie in the, the architecture, the discipline's progress into the, into the development of societal uh, and civilization, basically. So, so that's what, where I see the architectural theories embedding um, 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 the architectural agendas into an overall societal agenda. Marina, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I have a, it's, it's a similar question in a way, because I have this question about w where is an architect in the context of AI? And um, it's always in my mind, I, I know how to define what we do. And uh, so, so my question could be, like, if you, if you in, if, in your opinion, do you believe that an architect should be like this idea that we have of a surfer, like a kind of going with the waves, like a kind of flexible, uh, professional, or do you believe that we need to be more resistant in a way, and uh, and uh, like a more like a kind of warrior uh, to try to uh, I don't know to to yes to resist certain things that are happening around now are around us. So that that would be my question. Maybe I, I put two <laughs> figures. I don't know, but you can pick you have other. Well, I don't know. The resistance by itself is of interest. Of course, if you have certain fads and fashions which are vacuous and and short-lived, you, you shouldn't jump on them. Uh, but I think, I believe in movements. I believe in collective, uh, you know, um, um, endeavors, because that's where things tie into each other. There's a cumulative potential in, in, in many researchers over a number of years, achieving something, and that's something you, you I'm looking out for. I mean, so, so movements are important, um, and you should, you should be part of it, not being isolated on an isolated path. Uh, but yeah, if there's kind of uh, some fat, uh, they should be resisted. <laughs> but it's not easy sometimes to know. To, 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 that's what you need theory for. You, know, you need this, uh, in, 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 uh, an overall kind of worldview uh, with the certain key pri priorities and, and, and criteria of, 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 of critique and arg argumentation, uh, which where you can, you can kind of say, uh, how you know to either defend or dismiss, for instance, this new AI uh, research? I do, I would defend it. I would, you know, you can't be, and I think it's also important to not be over critical. I mean, the whole point of research and at the frontier in in, in the avant garde of innovation is that you have to um, you you have to give space. You have to you can't demand. Uh, final and concrete and pragmatically viable results too quickly, then you kill it. Uh, you know, I don't know what the proper time horizon is, but but when when gotta have a kind of strategic tolerance with respect to uh, that exploratory trajectory, if it if it's if the overall direction is is right, and I certainly think that AI research, I'm not sure the PhD group is 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 aiming for that, I would 100% um, support that and not resist that. I don't, yeah, I think that's definitely valuable. Do you have some further questions? Um, yeah, I think we need oh. to wrap up. Yeah. Maybe we face one more really than this. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I, um, this has been fantastic, Patrick. I, I you know, I really thank you for your generosity. Um, I, I just, I'm, I'm blown away by, by how, how generous you are, given the, the, the commitments you have. And I, frankly, I think for, for all of us, this has been incredibly insightful because you have a very 
um, a very privileged van vantage point where you can kind of comment on practice and cutting edge practice um, coming from a position of both a theorist and also um, someone who's teaching. And, and, you know, I think this is, this is, this is incredibly valuable for the rest of us. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, 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 I'm going to take this away and think about it. And I, what I would want to say is, is, is that this, is a, this has been spread all over the world. Some of our students, we have Anna, who's in Australia right now. We have several people in, in, several, several in, in, um, in China, and we are uh, live streaming through Billy Billy in China as well. So it's been a, it's been a kind of, the message is getting out there. So, um, well, but, but I'm, I'm just curious, is, is Philip and Wang Yu and Suman, are they students here in this program? Uh, yes, yeah. Well, I wouldn't say students, but I, I can't call them students. These are <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That's fantastic. yeah, I know, fantastic candidates, doctoral candidates, and I think it's fantastic. <laughs> okay. I mean, okay, we, I don't know. Also, Theodore Galanos, Theodore Galanos, he actually writes a lot of the software um, okay. for AI software. So we have and we have some fantastic, fantastic people on this, and it's really. I Excellent. It's an incredible Excellent. journey. Well, congratulations, guys! That's a good team. This seems <laughs> absolutely it's just great to keep learning. <laughs> I know. I, you know I, I think that's the point, actually, is, is, is that, you know, I remember the times when I went to the AA and I saw Rem coming, sneaking into the, into the lecture hall. And I think, you know, that's my point is if you shut down and you think you've learned it all, that you're never going to go forward. You have to keep learning. And, and you know, I always learn from my students and that it's a continual journey. Um, and uh, this has been a fantastic debate. So um, any final comments from anyone before we let Patrick go? <laughs> it's fantastic to have him here. I, I, so anyway, Patrick, I, we look forward to seeing to seeing what's going on. Especially, I want to see what's happening in China. The kind of work that's coming out. Um, uh, uh, it's 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 uh, you know. So um, thank you, thank you for your generosity. Um, I, I want to I want to finish one final comment, and that's uh, that we had Patrick Patrick very generously when I was teaching at USC came along to to USC for a conference there, and uh, we had this kind of debate going on. And I remember this one comment by Peter Zellner, um, who was kind of I don't know he was arguing about something. I'm not quite sure what, but anyway, at the final point that Patrick just kind of bombarded us with images from the office, and uh, Peter Zellner put his arms up and said. I surrender. And I think that in a way, you know, I, what, this is what I never, I don't have, I can argue whatever, but I do not have the background of all that work, which is so convincing, you know, and, you know, it's, I, you know, I've got to say that, that, that I don't want to repeat this thing. When I was a student, I, I eventually saw what was happening with Zaha's office and what was going there. I thought that's architecture, that's architecture. And I think this is really the contribution that has been made by Zaha and, and the office and you carrying on that thing is that, you know, to inject these ideas and this inspirational sort of um, work that's become a kind of catalyst almost to, to allow other people to open up and think in new ways. So I think that just to go back to Zaha herself, I mean, that's really what she's done. She's really kept architecture alive in a way and and opened up new ways of thinking. And I think that's exactly what's going on in the office these days. It's fantastic to see. I think history will look back on this office and say, wow, what a contribution that's been made. Um, so thank you, Patrick. Thank you both for this particular part, uh, uh, session and also for all the contributions you've made, um, theoretical, uh, educational, and the above all, the practice. Um, Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you Thanks, Patrick. Guys. And I Good just want to say the same, Neil, like Neil mentioned, that you continue doing this and keep on going with the legacy of Sahadid Architects. It's, it's really great listening to you today. Thanks a lot, guys. Good Thanks, you guys. Good luck. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Claudia. Thank